Okay, welcome everybody to this session on the test to be maturity profile. I'm Amato Shen, working at the implementation team here at UAL, and I'm doing this together with another focus and there, and a lot of other people that will speak uh, a little bit later. Um, we want this to be an interactive session with questions and comments from the audience. Um, I said participation might be rewarded. <laughs> So feel free to, uh, to raise your hand and to, uh, to keep the dialogue going. It's not just uh, a one-on-one -on -one session. So um, the background for this session is that uh, in the last uh, few months, uh, the NISP network uh, has worked on creating uh, something that we call the HS Community Profile. Uh, that is uh, basically a tool that can help us to understand more on where the HS implementation is in terms of maturity. Okay, so this is maybe your VHS implementation, <laughs> perhaps. So uh, the reason for having this tool is to, in a slightly better way, in a more systematic way, trying to describe what makes this game balance and not crash and fall down. We can sort of imagine how some type of being our nationwide HIV data. And the stuff below is like the boring plumbing that nobody wants to pay for, or wants to order, or wants to ask for. So this tool that we're presenting here today is a way to highlight a bit where a country is, where it's strong, where it's weak, where it makes sense to invest, co-invest maybe between partners, etc. Uh, we will hear from several people in the session. Uh, you see them here, it's uh, Sora, it is Vidya, we have Andrew from the Rwanda Ministry of Health, and uh, we have Kofi from his West Central Africa, and Joanne from his Uganda. We have Mark and Andrew from the Global Fund, and Corinne from Gabi. Um, again, we will try to make it nice and attractive. So this is uh, an overall picture of this tool that we have made. So the assumption is that if you have a HS2 implementation, it rests on some foundational pieces or aspects. You see them at the bottom. If it's hard to read, I apologize. Um, but our sort of idea is that we need to have certain things in place in order to succeed. So things such as leadership and governance needs to be in place. Um, you need to have a proper strategy and investment approach to be tries to do on a national scale. There are questions to be looked at and, and able to be employed as we to have in place around security and compliance. It's important to have a strong core team, people competent and available and paid and working there for a long enough time to know what they're doing. Um, to do be tries to maintenance and development. Um, you need strong metadata and complete point units in order to have complete and valid data and to be able to analyze it well. You need to have some sort of approach to training, both end users and your core team. You need to know what your facilities are and what the population in your catchment areas are, and also have proper infrastructure in place. So all of these things we call as sort of the foundational stuff, the, the, the pillars of a house that was valued. So, if this stuff is not in place or is immature or not working, it's probably a good idea to look at this in parallel with, with your uh, implementation. The, the other thing that we can assess through this tool is the maturity of different aggregate programs. So, for example, your aggregate HM indicator and program, EBI, surveillance, COVID-19, etc., etc. And then tracker programs. It's slightly different things that need to be in place, and slightly different questions that will that will um, inform inform that. And during this kind of assessment, it feeds into a bigger picture of evaluation work or assessment work we do guys do. Um, the slide here basically shows that there are certain assessments you could do when starting up. So, for example, we have something called a DHS2 readiness assessment. Does it make sense for this country to, to get started? Is the country ready to start to reach us to? And the same for trackers. And then this maturity profile that we're talking about here today is it's a bit of a cyclical thing that you can do regularly, maybe once a year, once every second year, etc. 
Uh, and it can inform other types of maybe point out that they should look closer into security and then there are special tools for that or diving deeper into the quality of the metadata, etc. And then of course we have the, the more in-depth research. Um, and it informs each other and it informs uh, planning developments and implementation. So why are we doing this? Or why have we done this? Um, I think uh, the DHSQ network has done various types of evaluations over the years in different, different types. Some have been a bit unstructured. This is uh, an attempt to be slightly more structured. Um, but then one of the reasons is to encourage more coordinated investments into DHRs too. So often you find that one health program wants this, one health program wants that, one health program wants that, and then nobody wants to play for a pay for that foundational stuff that makes the house balance. So it's a way to talk about that in a common way. Um, it also supports planning. What should uh, the his group or the country or the core team work on for the next couple of years? What makes sense to do first? What should we wait? What should we do before doing something else? Um, and as I said, yeah, support environment plus investment in donor interventions. Also, it's been a request from many of our partners and also internally uh, within this network to be able to see a bit more progress over time. Is the country moving? Like all the efforts that are going into strengthening the HIS to implementation, does it, does it help? What's the change over time? Um, yeah. And you can you can go down to the tiny URL at the bottom there. You can look at the whole tool, um, or just contact us, and you can of course read it later. How can you bring it up? Thank you. Uh, so I'll talk a bit about the the tool itself, uh, and um, sort of the, uh, what comes after the tool, the planning exercise that sort of goes hand in hand with this. Uh, so we basically set up DHS2 to handle this uh, assessment data. Uh, so we put the, uh, the questions into DHS and we have some reports that we can get out. Uh, eventually, we can also then set up um, uh, outputs for sort of monitoring uh, things over time that uh, I can't really talk about. Uh, so uh, we have this Excel tool, like I said. Um, which uh, has a sort of standard story. We have four categories, lots of questions within those categories that I mentioned, the foundation areas uh, and for programmatic areas. Uh, the idea here is that this should be done in a couple of days as a desk review, or we've added some additional programs, so maybe uh, a week, without sort of going into the field and um, spending lots of time. So it's supposed to be a lightweight thing. Uh, and the questions here, uh, it's meant to reflect that. Um, so this is just an example uh, of the outputs you get after filling in this um, tool and putting it in Excel. Uh, so we have what I'm going to show you, the sort of overall score in these different categories, which is basically just the sum of the different sub-questions, sub-indicators. Uh, but an important part of this is also to add a bit of context, uh, so adding some notes on the different uh, areas, uh, on the different sections as you're doing this uh, assessment, which will be important not only to interpret sort of the results, but also um, if we think of this as something you would repeat, then having a bit more context than just a simple answer will help in making it more uh, consistent as we repeat the exercise. Uh, of course, uh, one aspect of this is sort of looking at the status of the implementation as of uh, when it did assessment. And the, the key thing is that this is a tool to help you plan uh, strengthening activities around the DHS2 implementation. Uh, so, identifying and discussing, describing what uh, seem to be the weak areas, um, looking at what are actually in the plans of the Ministry of Health, what, what is being planned in the future, are there plans for doing uh, case-based HIV, for example. Uh, then having it as part of the uh, summary description of the status and the plans is important. And then the idea is to look at what specific activities uh, should we do to strengthen this DHS to implementation based on what this 
seem like the weak areas and the future plans. Uh, so along with assessment, we developed this short uh, template for uh, making a DHS2 strengthening plan, essentially, uh, which sort of goes hand in hand with um, the assessment itself. So the idea is you look at the stages, you look at the plans, uh, and you identify what should be the priority um, in the next year or two. Uh, so we added a link here, and you have, will have access to this slide, so you can uh, look at that one. This basically follows the structure of these bullet points. Weak areas, plans, recommended the chest to use ranking activities. Uh, and like uh, Anna said, the key thing with this is to strengthen, uh, so identify the foundational things within the DHS2 implementation that needs strengthening. Uh, to make sure that you're sort of not adding lots of uh, tracker programs, new health areas, without having a core team, without having the infrastructure to say. Because we know that what the EPI program will ask for is not that you train the core team, it's that they have an electronic organization with this week. Uh, Etc. Uh, so we sort of very generally uh, looking at the scoring of the foundational areas, which sort of thinking that if uh, you're not at least in the orange category, you shouldn't be adding more aggregate uh, interventions in a way. Uh, well, before you uh, add more tracker data, you should be on the light green as a minimum. That's of course. Simplification, uh, but as a sort of general, that's the general idea. Uh, but that's of course very hard to say in practice. First, you need to do all this, then you can start thinking of additional sort of interventions, expanding the scope. Uh, but the idea is that if you're doing electronic organization registry and you know that you have weaknesses in the core team or in infrastructure, the plan you make for rolling out an electronic organization registry needs to take into account strengthening all those foundational areas. Uh, so it's a way, when you make a plan, when you make a budget, using this as a way to highlight all the boring things that nobody normally wants to pay for in those plans. Uh, so I think that's the, the critical, um, critical step to think of this sort of as a Dependency where you have dependencies on foundational uh, stuff as you're adding more to the uh, first and second floor of the house. Uh, so, just as an example here, comparing uh, two countries in a way with uh, one at the top, have quite poor scoring in many other foundational areas. Uh, and it's maybe not the place where you would want to sort of dive into lots of. Uh, tracker case based uh, reporting programs, uh, unless you also address uh, um, training, uh, your reports to training and users, the core team infrastructure. Uh, whilst the one on the bottom is sort of doing better in the foundational areas uh, and is maybe more prepared to do uh, additional or like expanding the scope of the implementation. Uh, so this is sort of the, what we're thinking as the process within a country uh, that we do the maturity assessment to give you an idea of the current status of the implementation, uh, interpret the results, look at the weak areas, what are the plans, um, and then make a plan for strengthening uh, HIS and DHIS2, and then uh, have the his groups or whoever is supporting the country implementation. Uh, Follow up on those uh, identified uh, needs. And this is something that over time uh, you would do uh, in sort of a cyclic fashion. That was the end to our, uh, our introduction to the tool. So, our plan now is that we, if there are questions, comments to the tool itself, uh, we do that now just to use that you don't have. People talking for a few hours. Uh, so, any questions, comments we take now? Then we hand it over to Kofi, Andrew, John, Sora to give us our country perspective. We have the few countries that have been through this now, so we, then we will have some experiences. Uh, so, if there are questions at this point, like I said, there might be uh, other reasons for uh, asking questions and just getting an answer.
No. We have your, oh, one up here. Okay. Right. Yeah. 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 Hmm? And this is what you know. I mean, what you ice cream? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not all the questions you have. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to get your uh, comments about the team that would do the maturity assessment, what their skill set would be, and how they would work with the main programs. I mean, on your chart there, you show the HIV program on your TV. To what extent do those programs need to participate in this assessment to talk about which things they, they are dear to them and uh, or that perhaps are troubles? Thanks. Yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, we started last year. Uh, so, so the, the way this is, this is sort of being rolled out as we speak, more or less. Uh, so Global Fund and Gavi is supporting uh, the his groups to do this exercise in, uh, I don't know the exact number of countries, but a lot of 40, 50 countries, uh, like over the coming months. Uh, so the idea is that his group will be coordinating this, um, and I think it will depend. We'll also hear from the, the his team later uh, how they've been doing it so the, in the countries they've done it so far. But I think it will depend a lot on the context, the sort of relationship between his group and the ministry, how practically it will be done. Uh, so I think in some cases so far, it's already been the his who are supporting the DHS implementation, who does the first sort of round. I'm assessing this and then talk to the ministry and just see if they agree to the, the assessment. Uh, other places, perhaps the ministry is the one who actually takes the lead and completes this, and the HISP is sort of mostly coordinating uh, following. So I think it will be very context dependent how, uh, how that sort of this ministry uh, work will be. But the, the idea is that the Ministry of Health is sort of. Uh, the proofs, yeah. what comes out of it, is not something that is just doing isolation. It needs to be something that the ministry is behind, and of course the ministry are the ones providing the priorities of where they want to go forward. So One it's sort of the he's doing the work and the ministry is providing them. Um, Sorry, just a follow up to that response. And, and keep in mind that you know it's a heavy lift the first time you do this, and then after that, it's just about what changes that happen. So think of this also as a performance monitoring of the DHIS2 maturity. Uh, and so you know one, once you have that baseline, then it becomes easier to do this monitoring on a, a more regular basis. I just wanted to make that point clear too. Thanks. Sorry. I'm always interested in the relationship between a country's HMIS and the HIS2. Because if your HMIS is not working, then your DHIS2 is also not healthy. Uh, and when do we use them interchangeably and when are they secret? Yeah. Yeah, so that's uh, again another good question, uh, and it's something we've been discussing a bit while we've been doing this. Because uh, I think sort of traditionally we think of the test of HMIS and then we integrate stuff, but in reality that's not what is happening. Uh, so how do we do this? We sort of have um, one set of foundational uh, indicators. Uh, but in a country, you might have multiple DHS2 instances. So, how do you actually say that the infrastructure? Perhaps there is a one, one DHS2 instance for a particular program uh, hosted here. There's a separate DHS2 for the HMIS hosted here. Different people supporting, maybe with different stuff. Uh, so, at one point, we did discuss to sort of repeat everything for each instance of DHS2 in the country, but that would then not. No longer be a couple of days this this exercise. Um, 
that in, in those in some cases it will be sort of the quite subjective or generalization. Okay, we have these people supporting this instance, we have these people supporting this instance, maybe some of them are the same. Overall, we think the core team capacity is this. So I think that's given the limited depth we're able to go into here, there will be some yeah, approximations in uh, many of those things. Oh, one more question. Yeah. Last question. Last question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think we can also, uh, we have a quite long session. Yeah. So, uh, to, after all the presentations, we can also go back to uh, the questions to the whole. Okay. Thank you. I think my question is about the last. Uh, we, have, we may have some different instances. Uh, managed by the ministry or partners, that this tool take into account uh, in the scoring if this target uh, or somehow these instances are uh, well groomed or well maintained because it seems that we are, we are uh, assessing the matrix of our instance, uh, not related. Uh, okay. So, is there a score you have for instance, such results counting the scoring, uh, lower score or higher score, that kind of thing? Because we are in the interested in the higher than the results are increasing and increasing, and we are planning to identify uh, the one stats. So, how does that count? I think, uh, I think every country with this actually will have more than one instance, probably at some point. Um, so I think you just have to sort of do your best to make this uh, describe the overall status. Of course, for in extreme cases where you have uh, everything is completely separate, you could in theory then do this twice, for example. Uh, but we also do try to, to ask questions in the form whether the data is available, for example, through the HMI email programs. So maybe it's in separate issues, but do you have any mechanisms? Yeah. And I think in those cases also, it's important to add the sort of some description as you're doing this to say, okay, we've scored it like this because of this, but there's also a separate team doing this. So I think, uh, yeah. Sort of a limitation that we have to generalize. Um, yeah, that's how it is. I think we can welcome uh, Andrew. He can come back and to help Rwanda and talk about. Oh, sorry, Kofi, your slides go first. <laughs> sorry, man. Hi everyone, my name is Kofi. Uh, I need to say that I'm the best Kofi in the world. <laughs> I'm not beautiful, but still enjoyable. Uh, I'm happy to share with you uh, the finding from uh, actually using the model that they have presented and the nice compliment uh, can we? So, um, the context in Cameroon was that they had uh, three years ago designed a two year uh, DHS2 operational plan. Ula was there. Uh, Ula. Ula was there. And then the, 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 the plan was ending. And one uh, of the things that they have just designed their first uh, e health national strategy. So because of those two changes, major changes they had, they, they were in the need to actually renew their DHS2 operational plan. So we went through the process and the maturity model assessment was part of the, the work that we had done. So uh, we, we had a two days workshop, as Ula was saying, and then someone has asked about who are the assessors 
those are the pieces of uh, assessor that we have. We had the HMI team, we have the uh, country program management teams, TB, HIV, EPI, civilians, and also we, we had uh, undergone a series of meetings to prepare and then to finalize the work. So uh, when we, we finished the, the work, that is what can uh, what came out. Uh, we had uh, assessed the maturity uh, level of that country, and the result was that uh, the capacities that were there has been graded uh, uh, almost 60%, which is the adequate level. And um, there are uh, some cap capacities missing, which are uh, has been also graded. The interest of having an overall score was that we can follow them over time, and three years later, we'll come back and see how they have been moving forward. Uh, we have, uh, as they have said, we had domains in the tool. So uh, you can see uh, in that rather chart that for each domain we had a scoring. And that's again, is very useful for us to picture where we have to move forward. And you can see that at the foundational level, they are over, uh, uh, over 50%. Individual level data, there are some uh, uh, some tools that have been developed, some trackers, but they, are, they were not uh, using them actually, and some of them were not um, complying with the mutual uh, recommendations. That's why they got those readings. As Fula was saying, for each reading of indicators, we have to provide uh, explanations so that we can know why we have given that reading and that will inform our planning uh, process. Uh, that's the nice image that we, we have from our assessment. I won't take a lot of time on that one. So um, for you will see that in the domain, you have subdomains. And using those kind of features, you can know which are the domain you have to tackle first. And then the weakest domain that you have found there was the administration and maintenance. As Anne was saying, nobody is wanting to invest in this, but that is where we have the investment first to, to be going. And then you have security and compliance, and then you have a training of end users. So those are the, the first investment cases that we can sell actually to donors to help us strengthen the, the DHS2 from its foundations. Uh, moving to the aggregate data, you can see that CHIS was something that we have uh, to pay attention to. So that's why we had uh, uh, stressed that in, in red. And, and regarding the uh, individual, individual level data, you can see that you have uh, a case to address HIV surveillance and then generate uh, individual level data. In the country, they didn't have an EMR on any or any other individual genetic data. So that was the concern for them, and that was shown in the evaluation. So uh, one thing that was done with the camera was we actually used that assessment to inform their new plan. So the four uh, objectives of their new DHI2 operational plan directly stemmed from the maturity assessment. So we can see that objective one and two relates to foundational, and then the three relates to aggregate data, and the, the fourth one was about individual level data. So we directly use those findings to design the plan. Those are the top five um, uh, weaknesses that we have been showing in the previous slides. For example, regarding the administration and maintenance, we had identified a city to appoint a server admin to train and uh, in server DHS server hosting, and also to set up a, a support system using a ticketing system. Uh, for security, for example, we, we, have, came, we have come to an agreement on designing a policy for that and then implementing it. The same thing for the training of users, we actually have decided to implement a national training instance and then to 
design a tailored program for um, the districts and uh, regional officers to be using for their training. For CHIS in Cameroon, they have actually piloted CHIS, but they were not able to finalize the evaluation of that product, so we have recommended um, finally the relation and scale it up. And actually, the Global Fund is very interested in that, and they are eager to find uh, to have the detailed um, uh, budgeting for that. So for each um, of each of you that are donors in that this um, room that will be really interesting. If you're working in Cameroon to come across this uh, plan, we are having a session to validate it. That will be next week. That will be an online session. You can come and see what is going on there. And then we have also for the HIV uh, tracker, how we have recommended to review it. So the way forward is to scale up the exercise. We are uh, to complete the one in Togo. We have seven more countries that has been approved for that. If you have, you are working in a country that fits uh, that, uh, and you are interested on in doing that assessment, you just have to reach out to any of us so that we can show you the way to get there. The, I can say that the technical assistance for this assessment is granted. It is secure. You just need to send a request from the country and then you can uh, step in and help you to do that. And then, as they have said, we continue to improve the tool. Any uh, uh, experience from the field will inform how we can make the, the tool more um, uh, more useful for us to achieve toward achieving the chance to uh, strengthen the countries. Thank you. <laughs> so our, our okay. ice cream is not going to get a price. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, any questions to uh, Coco? Well, I'll be enjoying my ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, no, okay. Is a, a What's your hand? Did I see anyone? I oh, sure. Do. Okay. Uh, Microphones for you. I don't know. 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 I don't um, is there a new time to get those actions or how do I find to mobilize resources? Some of those look a little costly, but just on practical point of view, I'll just think about what it can be. Um, I don't know if it is uh, regarding the, the plan. Uh, if we are talking about the plan, the plan is actually uh, uh, something we want to sell. Uh, to sell not only to the government agencies, but to the partners. Uh, one of the presenters here was saying uh, this morning that they are fighting against donors. Uh, what we see usually is uh, that, um, I can say, scattered approach in DHIS2 and in HMIS. Having this kind of plan can help inform and have some synergy. So, uh, one, uh, we have some, I can say, some secure funds uh, from uh, the Global Fund, from Gavi, and from the, the World Bank, and from New York Those ones are secure. And they are asking us to provide them with uh, detailed planning and detailed budget. So uh, this is, I can say, part one. And then part two will be how we mobilize additional funding to uh, move forward. So. We have secured uh, some uh, resources, not all of them, and we are eager to discuss with uh, some more than us to move forward. Prosper wanted the next one. Yes, Andrew. Okay, thank you. Um, 
I think you try to reflect me and just give it to me. Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay. But uh, thank you, Coffee. I think mine will not be um, uh, because Coffee has really uh, highlighted everything through most of things that we've been doing. So mine will be focusing on Rwanda. Maybe quickly before I start the presentation, is that uh, we, we rolled out the J2 in 2012. Um, Ten years. <laughs> Yeah. When we went through this assessment, we found that there are things that we need to strengthen. So it's not about yes, it's about standards. So that's why I appreciate this maturity assessment because it came when we needed to have um, an tool that we, that help us to really assess ourselves and we put ourselves in the level or we know which areas that we need to really uh, focus on. So um like my colleague said uh, we for us in Rwanda we started by having the common understanding where we came together and look at the assessment tool. You know some of these questions you may get <coughs> Someone answering based on how you are interpreting the question. So the first thing we did was sitting together with the his team, then we went through the assessment questions and we had some clarification that we forwarded to the teams, we were working team, where we were not really understanding well what we need to do to achieve or what we need as an output from the from the end users. So after having ourselves familiar with the don't the, the, the assessment that's when we approach the, the Minister of Health in Rwanda. Um, so these are the examples of the maturity assessment that I will not really go through each and everything, but uh, these are the domains that we had to assess because you know uh, uh, there's this part called the foundation. And I always tell people that uh, you can have a good IT platform working well. But it fails not just because the system is bad, but when the processes are not well uh, designed, things are not well designed, you don't have documents that say what. So that's why the foundational part is very, very key because you know that's where we 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 we, we, we check if we have already have uh, like standard operating procedures, documents that define what you're doing, the processes are well defined. Uh, you have the body that really the core teams that really manages the system. Everything is really you find it there. So these are examples, but I didn't really um, listed others from the programs. Uh, so we had the leadership and governance, strategy and investment, and others. So for for Rwanda, this is how it is. Uh, the reason why I started by telling you that we started in 2012, I thought that everything is okay. But when we did the assessment, we found that we need to we have some areas that need our attention. So uh, you can see that when you look at the foundational parts, most of the things are green, but there are others that are not green. That you find that you have there are some details that the tool gives you in a way that it helps you to do the planning, it helps you to know where the areas I think, which I'm really encouraging all of us to do this kind of assessment. Uh, because on our eyes, when you look at what's implementing on your eyes, like someone who works in the of it like me, I can always see that all is okay. But when you have a tool like this, at least it shows you the area. Like now on a foundational part, you can see that I have uh, three uh, domains that I have to, to work on, and I have a planning and ensure that this one is also lifted up. And again, I like how these things are really highlighted because it's easier to, to for interpretation, visualization, and others. You only know that if it's red, it's bad. If it's yellow, it's in the middle. Then if it's green, you celebrate. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we, when it comes to, to the programmatic data, uh, there are some areas like tracker that we need to strengthen. And when you look at the aggregate ones, I think we have been really strengthening the aggregate parts. But again, you can see that we have the state It's not and and. Uh, I'm not surprised because we don't have that state system in place. So when you look at the foundation, like I said, you can see that at least we have most of the green. So that is the end of my presentation. So if you need any experts to assess 
Uh, oh, help you to assess. You can even tell me, then I'm here. You can do it. Thank you. Applications, qualifications. Already ready to the ice cream. Oh, <laughs> thank you. There was a question up there. The white runner. Okay, thank you. I'll also make a question as I'll speak. Um, thank you. Um, very good presentation. Thank you, Colin, and thank you also, and the other one from Rwanda. Um, um, first of all, my name is Atuzar. I'm from Somalia and Israel. We've been using the Asia School Science um, 2016 now, so it's been six years now. And I'd like to say in the beginning, it's not about the number of years, it's more about improving key issues, and we have a lot of to go catching up and Rwanda. So I was wondering, um, what your advice would be, because I'm really interested to do the age school and do the assessment, um, and just find out about the eight core components that you have just identified, where are we on each? Um, so what what your advice would be, and, and how, how, you, how do you think um, we should we should move ahead? I have the answer. So, um, there we go, sorry. Uh, yeah, if you would like to do it, the plan is to do this assessment and, and like the countries that we coordinate, country support for and, and others. So, you just reach out to the nearest group. And the tool is ready and available for anyone to read. And if you have any regret or feedback, like, why don't you study score like this? Or this doesn't make sense, you maybe we should add questions and stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. So, it's, uh, yeah. And sorry, this is Michelle, just to jump in from the chat. Oh, I'm sure. Hi. Hi. Um, so um, Somalia is one of the ones that had um, indicated early interest um, from the country team at Global Fund. Um, so they are already on the list. Um, so I'm guessing that um, um, the, the relevant HIS from the Southern and Eastern Africa Hub will be reaching out very soon um, to discuss with the government as well. Great, thanks. I'm sending you a virtual ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> He's one. Okay. So, uh, who, any more questions to add in? No? I think we can leave the floor. Do you want to say something, John? Or? No. No, it's fine. I'll give you a word to Sora. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Sawyer uh, from Australia. So um, basically I'm talking about the collective experience, uh, what uh, it has been the early progress in terms of his groups getting mature enough to do the majority assessment. Um, so we've done a couple of countries and we've seen some key differences between the past assessment tools that we used and the majority assessment tool. And then, uh, what considerations or what context need to be kept in mind if there is group in the majority session? So, uh, uh, all of us, we, his groups have worked with countries, they have done assessments at some point of time. Uh, but the previous assessments were quite rapid in terms of the only look at the HS design, the metadata, the functionalities, uh, the reporting rates, that's it. They didn't really go into details of uh, what really makes a functional data to a uh, system in country. The foundation areas, they were getting uh, ignored. Uh, they were not being assessed properly. They were not getting the, the importance that they deserve. But this still kind of uh, includes start from the foundation areas along with the HMI and also look at all the disease programs that we talked about. So we talked about HIV, TV, the malaria, IPI, COVID surveillance, COVID vaccination. So all the relevant uh, areas which we strengthen, the programs which we must strengthen, the assesses right from the aggregate to the factor uh, disaggregations. 
Uh, the earlier assessments that we did, they more or less had open ended responses. Uh, we used to write summaries, but then they really can give us a right matrices to measure against. But this tool has right matrices defined, so therefore, for categories where either it's uh, not applicable, not achieved, or the progress adequate or mature. So each matrix, each question gets assigned a specific matrix against a uh, definition which is given. So it's very easier for the this group or the assessor to understand the correct context in country for that question and assign a specific majority value. So it kind of is more quantitative and then also helps you to write a more better qualitative sound for that specific uh, Then it's not only an assessment tool, it kind of uh, uh, gives you a platform to kind of uh, see where the country stands uh, and then the country investments are guided to the tool itself. And it's not a one time process, it's again as and then we'll mention it's a cyclic process. You do a baseline assessment in a country, then you uh, convince the donors to uh, provide some fine for specific activities, then you do that assessment again to see where you have made uh, progress in quantitative quantity and whether those funds have been judiciously utilized and have they made an impact in the country. So these this assessment kind of helps to uh, do that comprehensive way of comparison as well, which with earlier there was no mechanism to do uh, in a way. Um, so the early implementation experiences that we have had, uh, that the country context is of uh, key importance. Uh, we've had experience of using the tool in Myanmar and Afghanistan. Both countries are currently in a politically challenged situation. So they don't, they're not working as a user in the Ministry of Health. They have a family offices, private people to talk to. So you definitely need to find a way where you can reach out to the right people. So in Afghanistan context, we did not know anyone from the Ministry of Health. So we had to rely on our past connections with the older HMIC. And they were in a transition mode. They were handing over responsibility to the new team. So they helped us to get in touch with the colleagues in HMIS and they helped us to do the assessment. Here, the his group was quite uh, not aware of what the exact situation of HMIS was right now because we were external uh, kind of viewers. We were not sure how the country was again coming up or revamping the HMIS after the political shift. So we let the HMIS team to fill the questionnaire and give us the information that where their research system stands at this present point and what they include areas to see that is what areas need for the With Afghanistan, it was clear that the system does exist because it was functional uh, before when the previous ministry was in place. But now with this takeover, the implementation has slowed down and it definitely would need a lot of effort in building capacities of the users so that again it comes up to the level of scale of the industry for. Myanmar was a completely different context. We have no access to the ministry now. Uh, they only write to us when there are certain circumstances. So there the Global Fund Principal Recipient Leonox is our uh, kind of focal point where his group did the assessment on behalf of the ministry and then sent it off to your ops to get it uh, review it because they're also aware of the programmatic situation in country for different programs. And then of course they it was their responsibility to find a way that they reach out to HMI somehow and get that to the test again. So that our findings, the understanding that his group has uh, gets uh, assessed and gets corrected. So, based on the context of the country, uh, you'll have to find alternative approaches on how you approach the ministry, how you approach the HMIC to do these assessments. You need to know your stakeholders very well. Uh, now, there are different countries where you have integrated HMIs where even the HMIs scope can give you all the information for all national programs, but there are scenarios where you need to reach out to parallel programs to get the information. But, Therefore, when you start doing an assessment, you need to do a mapping that whether you have the right people to talk to and to whom uh, you need to talk so that you get the most relevant information out of the uh, assessment. Uh, for the, assessment. Uh, the premise has to be said very carefully. Uh, assessments are quite frowned upon uh, because they really are kind of seen as um, someone doing an audit, but we're not doing an audit. We're not doing a performance audit for anyone. It's just trying to identify what areas the country uh, needs more and more support so that those areas could be reflected as transparent as possible to the donors so that they make right decisions in terms of funding the respective countries. So when we reached out to Afghanistan, we clearly told them we had to call with them that why is the reason that we're doing this assessment because Global Fund wants to see what are the potential areas right now which need more spending. And then uh, if you let us know the key information as transparent as possible, we will be helped you in that much and much better, uh, much better manner. There. 
So when a health group approaches, they have to be very careful in putting up the, the whole uh, objectives behind in this session. And of course, to give an assurance that this data that we're collecting is not going to get used anywhere else without their consent. So that uh, establishment of a trust factor is very important when you do this assessment of the uh, being the his group who is supporting the country, uh, there has to be some bias involved. So uh, the guidance is only uh, what we see is that we know that we as a his group are providing support to the country and we want it to be all in green boxes, all in adequate. So that you knows that is never the situation. So when you are doing this assessment, try to say as practical as simple as possible because your influence and your uh, way of looking at things, you may also influence the ministry that. This is where we actually stand, and this is, and if we uh, share this information as in, in as two cents as possible, uh, it will be clearly visible to the donors who uh, put more money on that study. So, as his group, uh, we should uh, navigate the bias and be as cheaper and practical as possible. So, these were our two learnings that we had in the assessments that we've done, uh, and we hope uh, as we go ahead, we learn many lessons on how to uh, perfectly use the tool to make. Uh, pretty sensible. Thank you. Yeah, I succumb to the question. Questions for uh, Sora? Okay. Actually, the question was a tree, Pastor Barnum, and the coffee. If you have any surprise on the results, anything that you don't expect, because you want a good surprise, I don't want to know the bad surprise. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I mean, um, for both the countries, we're still assessing the results. So, um, there are two questions. Yeah, so for both the countries, we're still assessing the information that we work from them. So we feel that it, it's not a mundane process that we get the response from them, that's the final work. Uh, for both the countries, the responses that we provide, we have to follow up questions to make sure that uh, uh, the history group and the country are the same way. And this is what we need when they say that it's adequate. So we need to cross check that. Uh, so that we, uh, if there's any of the sensitive matter, we don't want to pass on information which is not correct. So we're trying to double check with uh, the officials that this is what we need and understand this thing. So uh, we are yet to have, uh, at least for us, we are yet to finalize both these tests in terms of reports and so that it can be shared with by the audience. Right. We actually have two surprises, a good one and a bad one. When we did the assessment, by the end of the assessment, uh, we're not able to retrieve the whole data because we were having some internet challenges. So we uh, we didn't have the final uh, say. And then we went for the, uh, the the break and then when we came back, we were able to pull the data and everyone was surprised by the, the categories that we had, which was adequate uh, almost uh, before matching. And that was a round of applause Everybody was very happy. Uh, the HMI director was so proud, and <laughs> that was so interesting. That was the, the, the good surprise. The bad surprise was about security. And nobody was thinking about it because when they started DHIS2, they started with aggregate data. So security and privacy was not a concern. So they have just started in DHIS individual data and nobody was thinking about it. So it was, oh, we haven't thought about it. So it triggers the discussion about it. Oh, you want to respond to it. Okay, um, I think uh, for us, um, the surprise we had was like we, uh, we used to present our implementation and uh, everyone was really attracted in saying that we are we are taking ourselves as people that have a good implementation in terms of uh, life scale. 
And every time we were presenting, it was really at a good level that uh, we were really also saying that we are really investing much. But when we did the assessment, there are just small, small things that you find that we didn't even talk about it. And we find that it makes everything to be either yellow or red. So, <laughs> so most of the time we find we really focus on the bigger things. But uh, most of the things that put our implementation down are just small things that we don't really focus on. So most of the stuff that we, are, we have as a recommendation to improve or like, in our planning or attention, they are not even big things, they are just small things. So, that was our progress. Uh, uh, maybe a, a bad thing that we the only thing that when we started, we are kind of weird novels that we what, how. So after having that process of the meeting with the teams, we managed to understand the domains, the domains and how they are contributing to our own outputs. So I think the other thing that we probably I have a question actually for three and four, three or four communities. You are talking about the materials and quality of the bridge to the And when you are out there, just start. But we want really to know if you have to start all over again. What's the, the, the advice you, you would tell us? You know, if the world could go back 10 years ago, what well, would we have done? And both of you, what's going on with the six years ago? But I'm pleased that you are saying, I wish I did that. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, um, this is a, a tricky and uh, it's not a easy question. That's what we are saying. I'm to have to go. So, what is not good? We should have been here today. By the way, it's a good question. Actually, if um, to implement the HS team around that day, what I should focus on, I should focus on the preparation. I mean, engaging all stakeholders, working on that foundation part. You see, the foundation part is not much of implementation, it's having documents in place. Uh, ensuring that everything is well clearly defined. Uh, if it's a standard operating procedure, ensure that it's in place. If it's, it's, uh, if it's the uh, implementation plan, you have a good implementation plan and the way you evaluate it. And, and when you are done with that foundation part, then you start the implementation. Actually, uh, what my experience with uh, implementing uh, this IT solution in large scale? Most of the time, you find us moving in the rest of the ICT. Then we focus 80% of our time, we just look at the system, the dashboard, the pivot tables, and other things. Then we forget the other side. We forget the other side. The other side, the other side that has people and they have the processes. That is the 80% of successful implementation of whatever we do. Because, you know, like if I give an like, example of Rwanda, what we started with was Ensuring that uh, we harmonize all the processes, the reporting form of the registers, we align everything, ensuring that indicators are linked. We reduce the guarantee indicators, we ensure that the protocol collect is linked to the either any strategy, any commitment, global commitment, anything. So, anything that is not around there, we just remove it. I remember in 2011 when we started the process, we we had 45 pages of reporting form. But, but after putting those criteria, and we bring you to come and see if whatever you are pushing is linked to any criteria, strategic plan, uh, global commitments, maybe funding, and other things, you will remain with only 12 pages when everyone's here. Mm -hmm. So it means we reduce almost 60% of the reporting form just because of those criteria. So for me, I would really focus on the, on the governance part, ensuring that we have all the legal documents, we have those guidelines, we have SOP, we have implementation plan, we have the budget, we mobilize partners to come together, we work with reporting form, ensure that you are agree on integrated reporting form, you harmonize the register, you harmonize the uh, uh, patient files, ensure that it, it really fits well when it comes to report. Another thing that you have to be careful, where 
whenever you are working around the reporting systems, ensure that you reduce the workload. Don't collect anything that you not use. So you reduce the workload of reporting because that is the, the main thing is that you, you collect only things that people will use. Then when they, the more they use them, the more quality, the more you increase the quality of their data. The more the quality of data increases, people have will have that confidence of taking decision on the what you are So I think for me, I will be starting with the foundation part, then the rest will work by the start. Thank you. And uh, anyone else want to go? Go ahead. So then I think we're going to be hosting. I will do the same. Um, I will have a particular uh, attention to integration. Usually we start the system by uh, doing just a piece of it, and then we do another piece. And then another piece. And then we try to figure out how we can do them all together. This is the baddest way to, to do it. We should be starting by seeing how we start uh, from the, the integration part. And then we have all the, the big picture and we say which, uh, which part we start first and then which other block we can have, like Legos. But uh, usually, the, the money is coming from malaria. So you build the malaria cord, and then after you have some money from API, and then you build the API. And that is the worst way to do it. If anybody is um, at the place of starting it, so you should start by thinking systematically, using the building block system, ensuring that you can add things on top of it, not having a scattered system, but you have is consistent. That would be my uh, my real question if I'm starting first. Thanks. Uh, Andrew Kofi brings me to something that the latest thing I've got to be in my wallet about is um, how to help countries with the density amount of data that they collect and to move away from this terrible risk of mobility and mortality for inpatients and outpatients in ages and genders and all sorts of things and rather move towards the WHO um, for facility by the way in ages, malaria, the EDI, or the ECH. And so we concentrate more on looking that about quality of care. And this terrible list of raising which is poor quality, you can't lose, and, and it just patterns up your data base. So, um, thank you for reinforcing the fact that you need to start with as little as, little as possible, but we have to have a good stigma and organize and then what buys into it. Hopefully, you want to devise your country's HMIs. I've got a few countries, it can be that. Thanks for the Thanks, So, then, Mark, do you want to? Great, thanks. Uh, Mark Andrew with the Global Fund, I'm presenting on behalf of Michelle Moreau and I. Uh, uh, so just just to um, reinforce, I mean, we had discussions uh, several months ago with uh, UIO and uh, the His Hub community um, to pay for this. We wanted to, to have this as part of the, uh, the the future of of the Global Fund's way of working, uh, using maturity model approaches to understand uh, clearly, systematically. Uh, where we can compare uh, situations across countries, but also to help us in our grant making cycle and decisions that we make. Um, we're in a replenishment year, as we say, uh, for Global Fund, um, which means that starting next year, we'll have another some requests that go out. Uh, countries, CCMs uh, will develop uh, their, their grant proposals, et cetera. And so we wanted to look at for all of the investments that we have made in DHIS2, uh, that's not only for the HMIS, but also for current disease programs and other uses, including uh, more recently with C19, 
um, you know, how do we make a clear case for uh, what is being asked for and what is it based on? Uh, and so one incentive that I'll, I'll put up uh, to start, uh, just to, I just have three slides to share, is that uh, we want to see uh, countries go through this exercise, uh, not only for yourself, which is the most important. The ministries understand where they are, how well things are performing. We heard some great testimonials already uh, from Andrew and some of the experiences from uh, Cameroon and uh, other countries, Afghanistan, Myanmar, et cetera. Uh, but, you know, it's important to know your status uh, in terms of your your own uh, issues and, and gaps, and, and then where you can uh, find opportunities, as I think uh, Nick mentioned, how do we use this uh, assessment result for mobilizing resources uh, to identify and address those gaps uh, with domestic funds or otherwise? So, so we are in love with maturity model approach-based assessments for the sake of uh, for the reasons that I'll go into to even more, so but uh, just so we again can have a nice, uh, easy, uh, easy way to understand where where we are, where our investments are from, um, having impact, and how to compare. Uh, another example uh, within the Global Fund is, is even with our new digital health framework, we have a maturity model approach that we're using uh, to, to uh, measure and monitor uh, progress uh, across some of the uh, core uh, digital health areas as well. Uh, so, so why? Why are we going through this? And I, and I mentioned some of these points already in terms of the rationale, uh, but uh, as, as um, one of our uh, persons here in question, uh, how does this fit into a bigger picture? So uh, DHIS2 is just one platform or application and software. Uh, we're interested in the whole of the digital health information ecosystem and uh, not just only uh, where uh, we're investing with DHIS2, uh, but there are other parts. And we heard again, the last round of questions, uh, what would you do differently? Um, but I think, I, I think it was a lack that said they're starting out, but you are, you have, you, it's a luxury that you can say you're starting from scratch now in today's world. But the reality is we're not. And so, uh, we, we believe that it's important to, uh, remember to get back to investing in some of the basics, some of the foundations. So uh, for, 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 for Global Fund, uh, in addition to thinking about, um, you know, some of the, the programmatic uh, needs for, for why we want to understand how to invest more strategically um, and, and how to unpack a very complex um, order of business, which is strengthening uh, the digital health information systems and data systems. Uh, that uh, we wanted to look at this in, in a more broader uh, lens. And so we have, uh, have just launched and are, and are developing a, a, a comprehensive digital HMIS maturity model that uh, you can think of this CHIS2 uh, maturity profile as, as a component of that, which is aligned and complementary to uh, looking at the, the broader, more comprehensive lens. Uh, and so you, you can see uh, for some of the benefits, as I mentioned as well, for uh, decision support for our grant making cycle, identifying the gaps, accelerating uh, towards uh, sustainability and scaling up, improving interoperability. And as we heard as well from some of the examples already, it's very easy to understand when you're using colors and, and maturity levels and, and show direction based on uh, the way that these outputs are, are developed in dashboards, et cetera. But what I wanted to get to with this slide is look to the right. So we didn't want to start from scratch. Uh, we are adopting and adapting the Global Digital Health Index. Uh, many of, of the countries that are represented here at this conference uh, may be familiar with that and have used it. But there you have a lot of these foundations that we have been alluding to and discussed already a little bit. Things around the, the data security, privacy, confidentiality, things around the use of standards um, and thinking about uh, the, the workforce and the capacity development needs um, infrastructure, which uh, you know, is often much overlooked in terms of the total cost of ownership of these investments. So we're, we're adopting the, that suite of 19 GDHI indicators as part of the foundation. And then we have specific priorities at Global Fund, particularly uh, HIV, TB, malaria, as well as uh, pandemic preparedness and response. And, and and of course, the emergent requirements due to COVID-19. Uh, but these are informing some of these illustrative areas uh, that we want to, uh, you know, top up and, and have 
ways to measure those on a maturity basis as well. And, and so uh, the last thing I wanted to, to, to just uh, suggest for uh, perhaps some discussion is what do we want to do with this intelligence, right? So uh, think, think of this as a way to not only understand your performance, but uh, you know, how can this become part of our, uh, our, our, our journey and pathway to ultimately better evidence-based decision support? Uh, not only to understand uh, our and, and uh, think about more equitable delivery of services to uh, the global fund priorities, uh, but then you can see in uh, the blue part of the arrow, this is the crux of this in the way going forward. So we want to see uh, these maturity models. If, if you are investing in DHIS2 and you want to put up uh, resources in the next grant, uh, we want to have that uh, DHIS2 profile. We want to have a sense of a broad, among the broader uh, HLIS maturity level, including these other aspects around foundations, and then think about how to uh, inform the grant investment process and ultimately target the technical assistance. Of course, in yellow, you can see uh, there are uh, inherent commonalities that we've detected and we know that countries need to, to invest more in around the digital and data governance, uh, the use of architecture and, and blueprints to inform uh, that uh, it, uh, interoperability readiness as well as adherent, adherent standards, et cetera. And then ultimately improve at the end of the day, uh, better data quality analysis, interpretation and use. Uh, so the, these maturity models and these approaches should not be done in isolation. For us as a donor, uh, they help inform our decision-making processes for, for grant making. But I think more importantly, most importantly, uh, particularly for Ministry of Health, we see these as a way to, you know, identify and, and uh, have, have a clear basis for understanding the implications of some of the issues and gaps and challenges uh, that can be identified using these tools, but then also be a way to inform others and help uh, create demand for resources to fill those gaps going forward. So we're super excited about uh, the CHIS2 maturity profile. We have other maturity assessment approaches that we're taking. Uh, and, and, and this is part of our, our way that we want to move forward with the way we use this intelligence for improving the decisions that have to be made. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. I'm very sorry you didn't get an ice cream. <laughs> they all have uh, I think the report questions are people were to, to come in, so we'll put a little bit of name on that. I'm just sorry because they were
then what are you going to do? Of course, you know, it's like your back It's uh, when she realized that from the assessment, you know, that you plan on what things can be done to improve, they can use the wrong thing in country to support the question of course. They can use the technical assistance available if they need it uh, to uh, support, um, to make any progress. So this is one thing that can be done, and it will be most of the international to the the country level. Now, what else you can do as a donor, working as a group of the event, we don't have much time in Gali, but we are trying always to do advocacy. And this systematization, you know, if like the 50 country assessment, security is great, in 80% of the country, we can try and go and mobilize all the donors or even in house to find even more than people that. So, this is not the one thing we can put into. And also, we can always you know, try to find cost effective way to support, you know, you know, more regional activities or security or what's going on. So, it's what we can do. But at the end, what is important is really, I think, the process by itself. And I really love the way. Uh, we presented it, and I like your first slide, I think it was on Zoom. Just sit, look at it, take your time, step back, and plan. Don't take, it, don't take this as an obstacle, actually, just to, to, to tell you what is the way uh, to design your next journey for the chance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. Yeah, I mean, again, as Karim was saying, uh, I'm part of the security team at this issue, and we are working together with Pula and Elan to actually find a way to build, alongside with this maturity model, to provide some help and support, allows you to improve on that first step. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, as I said, I'm a uh, and work with security team here at DSHU, and I work with Olaf and Anne to, you know, with this maturity model and try to, we are trying to find out ways to uh, be capacity to help you have that box from red to like green, right? Um, but again, since we are starting this, I would encourage you to perhaps, you know, we need your input and feedback to find out ways to better sustain and help you in, in improving this. So, uh, perhaps later, I mean, feel free to just reach out to me. There is the security branch, you know, later on. So feel free to come to us, tell us what your changes are, why you score red, and, you know, what we can do, you know, to help you in this. So, yeah, just want to talk about Thanks. Eric. Thank you. Uh, any questions, comments to the whole session? Or I think this one was a question of the Was this exercise for all countries or still there are some countries where it was missing? So I think uh, this is only just starting off now. So I think uh, so far five, six countries have gone through this exercise. Yeah, and another 20 years on the pipeline that companies are going to start to do that. Yes. In the next two months. In the next two months. And any country can do on that yes. because uh, we actually have Gavi and Global Fund uh, coming together to support that uh, assessment. Yeah, really, uh, Gavi and Global Fund coming together to support. An assessment to have a more comprehensive investment in government. So, if you are willing to you know, be a candidate for that, then let us you know so that we can allocate and discuss with Karen and Mark that just right here and then secure that this as as quick as possible. Yeah, but I can support it in four countries. Yeah, is that um, that um, it's been rolled out right now. We did a pilot in uh, in Rwanda, in Cameroon, uh, in Ethiopia. That was so. That was a pilot for us to learn lessons from, and from those lessons, 
Now we are really not the different countries, including Somalia. But let's take our the next one, I guess, is the priority area for us. Uh, but we are really not into several countries. So these groups are supporting different countries to uh, work very closely with the Ministry of Health in order to get this done. Uh, we will explain that a little bit later on in uh, explaining the work that we are doing, but that's one of our critical areas that we're working on. Thank you. Yeah. I think that uh, uh, this is a question of our council of excellence. Uh, when we are starting the system, uh, one of the speakers say uh, uh, that the problem is created by either uh, media or media. So the system is very difficult to make it for that. So, my, just my catch here is this assessment is it going to be uh, put more pressure on the government of the new assessment on? Is it for the guy and the global party specific program, or is it the whole system that we are going to Because that is the issue we have in starting some of this. You have so many times in the US that are really done with the system that are not even in the countries. So, what is the catch up? We don't want to repeat the same. I will let my face carry in now. Yeah, somebody's like, that's an outstanding question. And um, I, I, I think the way I respond to that from past experience with WHO and also with Global Fund now, that uh, taking any entry point that presents itself. So, for example, in Myanmar, where Global Fund invested in uh, HIV, TB, malaria programs, uh, there was difficulty in tracking individuals uh, through different points of service delivery, et cetera. And so the discussion became around how to use unique identifiers and create what's called a master patient index to service those vertical programs. What happened next was then the HMIS group got involved and they're thinking, ah, but we want to have EMRs uh, in the next five years or so. So that issue around uh, uniquely identifying patients and individuals, with, uh, you know, client registry or using, using unique IDs became a whole of the health system uh, issue and, and it was an opportunity. Uh, so so in any of these investments, I think what, what these tools can do is unlock uh, the potential for how they can become a starting point for uh, you know investing in foundations that are going to service the entire health system at large. Other examples around the use of uh, health facility uh, lists and, and uh, health facility IDs or health worker IDs. Some of these building blocks around registries is just one example. Uh, so so I, I think I think one of the challenges, of course, is always you know how to uh, you know have the right uh, Viewpoint just to see those opportunities that present themselves, and using the DHIS2 shared profile is one way. Using other assessment tools is another. Uh, but taking advantage of those and making it a whole of the health system uh, issue is also, I think, another way to take these investments and get more value. And just to complement and elaborate on what Dr. first I believe we are looking at the two other competing collections. We have technical partners in the alliance, so the uh, WHO, UNICEF, and CDC, and World Bank. So we don't look at the technical agencies. WHO provides the, the, the guidance on the indicators on the data we support them. And we do not influence the content of the HIS2. There is University of Pursuers and CHF, so the working of the matrix WHO. So what we try to do is that, unfortunately, there is no a, like worldwide cross donor agency which professionalize does not exist. I'm not responsible. So <laughs> I'm trying to advocate for it. Does not exist. So the main players you know now for all the agencies too is no hard, yes, but otherwise it's Kelpa, Global Fund, Gabi, and Bates. All of them support the design of our vertical program. We are calling for more integrated investment. I think even when I talk, I said anyone wants to support this workshop. So we are calling for more integrated uh, donor to come and support HMIS development. Waiting this 
Who is that that is report? Oh, I can say that you know, for a musician program in majority of the countries, there is no tracker for a musician, but we support all the foundation of any advertisement of all the foundation, regardless of what the musician means. Okay, so really, at least from the academic perspective, there is no intention to, um, you know, to to inform the technical context, it's not that, but really, this is finance, but it's approved and recommended, um, like, uh, for the leadership. But for sure, you know, it's a result of partners who can help, with a more intelligent view, it will be better, but within that, we are just together, we will make it. Mm. I would like to compliment Mark said, uh, grab the fund. That's the first thing, grab it. We need funding, you have an opportunity. Jump on it and take it secure. That's very important. Second thing, provide evidence. The problem we used to have is that while we will be, I used to be working with the global fund. So while we're defending our choices, we don't have strong uh, argument to defend them. So this maturity model, either DHS or the DGHI, provides you with evidence to inform, to say, hey, if you're trying to help us in malaria, uh, bed legs, muscle bed legs, that's very nice, but you cannot sustain that if you don't have, for example, uh, a well uh, built DHS core team. You cannot uh, improve, for example, HIV data if you don't have a good privacy and the security policies to protect data and so on. So when you have those kind of evidence and information, then you can support your argument and bring the, the technical debate to what is important. Third, take a piece of it. What, uh, when uh, the malaria program or malaria uh, PMI is coming and bring the money, for you, you don't ask them to support the whole foundation. We work to secure a part of the foundation with PMI. And then part of the foundation can be supported by PEDFA. And then part of the foundation will be uh, supported by GAVI. And then for each of the pieces of the uh, uh, program driven uh, funders, you can get funded a piece of your foundation. Bringing that synergy can help you put together the big events. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, my question is a uh, bit general on the tool itself. So I know that much uh not much injury, but I'm thinking how 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 is the tool addressed for other public partners like agriculture or in uh beyond health? Can we somehow customize it and use it for assessing in other innovation like the learning yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, we have started thinking about the general education that we'll be working. Um, I mean, it's, it's built off figuring out what kind of question does it make sense to ask for education in particular. If you have the same beach as the course, you know, you're sort of resting on the foundation. For education, is a little bit different. It's different ministry, it's maybe a different team when it's growing, right? So maybe we'll have to do two separate assessments. But for the for agriculture, for example, I would maybe just look at the tool and get inspired and start thinking what relevant to think about for agriculture. The way that we built it, it's very simple. It's just an Excel document with some questions and some scoring, and then we built it in DHS to the import function. So people can work in Excel with the ministry or with stakeholders, and then we just push it into the DHS to generate the report on this. So yes, it's flexible in that way. I mean, it's, I mean, take the ball and run with it and come to us when we build for agriculture. <laughs> 
Yeah, everything is trust. Everything is free, open, free. Yeah. Even the ice cream. Any question from South Africa? I know that you co represented and also for sharing this um, talk. I was just wondering <clears throat> as more and more information becomes available, um, how you actually can open them up using the tool to establish a maturity level, develop a maturity model for implementation. In the sense that in South Africa, we need to develop um, a maturity model for implementation in terms of and um, level zero, level one, level two, level three, level four, with key tools and engagements. Um, we'll be using a concept of looking at um, for each one of the levels you have with authority and how much authority do you have to actually implement that specific majority level of information. And then um, looking at is it acceptable to all the stakeholders, whatever is implemented. And, in ensuring that the communication and the engagement and the emotional maturity of people accepting the change that comes and then to end. And then also then, which is I think a lot of the foundational building blocks is the ability to implement, evaluate that ability to implement with each level of the implementation of the journey. I think what we, as people are using this and, and more of the information comes in, it could lead to a um, maturity model in different levels to steer implementation, especially when we start the fresh or implement a new component and so forth. Just think that is an excellent opportunity to that Thank you so much. Uh, again, the way that we have done it, it's there are many of these all out there. So we looked at it as we did something that was pretty features to specific that would sort of answer our features to questions and next steps. I think there's plenty that we can learn from other ways of doing it. Um, I think I'll stop there. Mark, you want to keep going? I think you're making a very important point. And I mean, this has just been tested in a few countries. The plan is then to, as you're suggesting, how do we link this into a decision support kind of tool to then link it to, okay, so now you, you, you're flashed the screen with lots of red and orange. What are the, the work packages or steps that are needed to address those particular areas? Uh, you know, and how do you prioritize those against other competing demands? Uh, as Coffee mentioned, uh, you know, take a little bit from this project, a little bit from that, uh, you know, have those, those decisions that have to be made with the right stakeholder group, those, as you suggested, in authority to make decisions over that area, et cetera. So this is the start. We, we, we wanted to you know, level the playing field to begin, find out where countries are at systematically, so we can look across, you know, we have hundreds of, of, of grants going out uh, every cycle uh, with, in, you know, investments in DHIS2, for example. So we want to make sure that we can start with a way to have a good uh, view uh, and, and then the next phase, of course, is exactly what you're suggesting and I'm trying to reinforce and we're talking with UIO, is how to make this uh, you know, more usable in terms of implementation support. I can just add that this is uh, our summer holiday project. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, the next step for, for us or for us, uh, UIO now is to try, we have a lot of guidance on different topics to try to merge these two worlds a little bit so that at least the guidance that we do have is linked to this. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, it's really a um, very good uh, tool and uh, I'm so moved. I also find out things that it's something new and uh, so many of the aspects of the game that I like to use of this. So, oh, you want to find a legal is that a really like the standard that should actually uh, mm -hmm. under that? Uh, the, 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 like, 
get a step by step to see the process of the back and just be able to make sure that I saw the right of aspects that we can get back to the process of the and so I, I think so from our side, it has been very uh, pragmatic approach in terms of identifying what are the areas uh, we want to include here. Uh, and how the user defined the majority of has been basically based on collective experience within that network. There's been lots of from back and forth taking feedback from the scoring and the questions. Uh, so we haven't really mixed anything other than sort of the experience and experience in the information system. We have looked to other people. Visual health research tools out there, and we have looked to those and gotten uh, inspiration from those. Um, there's no one global standard ISO certification that I know of for history of health information systems. Russell. Oh, sorry, sorry. We yeah, also lost you, sorry. Thank you. So uh, I think uh, what can I you say? Can you say my Yeah, so my name is Ross Walnut and I have a service. Uh, I think uh, these two could have come at the time, especially for Ghana, because then, uh, like Rwanda, it is our team here with DHIS2. <laughs> Uh, in terms of, I think, 
looking at our dementia story in this tool, it's essentially your implementation guidance. This is what you should plan for uh, in the future. I think uh, that's something we'll be working on. So how do you get from this level to this level? It is just kind of and have some more clear, clear guidance. And uh, more questions, comments? <laughs> I'm just picking up on a, on a few things about um, is there a, a you know, ISO or some kind of a, a global gold standard? No, I mean, that's not what this is. This is a very subjective tool, uh, but there are components of it. We want to talk about the data security or about the performance of the system, etc. There are standards for some of the more technical aspects of it. Particularly when we come from the, the IT um, industry and the standards that are there. But, but to the other point, you know, there, there are so many tools like this in, in the market right now. We mentioned the GDHI, which is measure evaluation tools for uh, rapid assessment tools. There's the WHO score uh, for health data tool. Uh, there's, uh, there's others. There's a, uh, a, 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 a continuous quality improvement tool uh, as well uh, that we measure development. And others. So I, I just want to, to suggest you know, use the right tool for the right purpose at the right time. Uh, and, and this this one is really to help optimize the DHIS2 performance. And I hope one of the key messages that have come out through uh, the presentations and discussion is that don't leave the foundations behind. If you if you if you're like Ghana or Rwanda or Uganda, uh, you know now's the time to. Uh, to go through this again, this exercise, and, and get back to the basics and think about how are you going to sustain and maintain and, and keep these systems operational, especially when you start to interoperate with other systems. And are, are the DHIS2 systems and platforms and extensions and programs fit for purpose uh, for building on additional uh, components and modules, et cetera? Uh, so, and, 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 and we want to, from, from a, a donor standpoint, and you know, I know uh, Karine, Gabi, and others. Um, you know, we, we want we want to use this as a way to justify those investments in those foundations that are going to help sustain these investments and their durability even longer than you, you might have been prepared for with the existing resources you have. Uh, so I, I think that's I hope uh, been, been profoundly said many times over from many of the speakers already about you know, keeping some resources. Available for some of the, the investments in the foundation, particularly around the long term operation and maintenance of these uh, systems and the capacity that's needed to keep them going. Thank you. Uh, so, then, unless there are any final, final comments or questions, I think we'll uh, end it here. Thanks to the presenters. Thank you, Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.